my, my role this morning is to actually uh, look at the, what ICT is playing or what is the role of ICT right now in the public safety domain. To give you a short introduction, I belong to a business unit that takes care of um, public, public safety and safer cities. So I would be discussing what have we been doing in the Philippines. And actually my customers are myself and maybe most of your resources and most of the people here. So uh, to give you an idea who we are and what we do, we've been always known as a telecommunications company, but we have, been, we have ventured for quite a while into the identity space. So we are now looking at biometrics, biometrics for the public sector, biometrics for the enterprise. What are we, uh, so aside from the telecommunications um, group of NEC, we put in a lot of R&D effort and a lot of, um, a lot of projects has been done based on uh, our, the services for public safety. So focus group, I'll be looking at some parts for citizen services and immigration control. Um, I'll be discussing some of the public administration services that we have done for this country. And I would take you to some historical facts. What we were before and where are we now? And what we actually hope for this country to become. So just to give you an idea, as a track record, we own most of the 850 million identities all over the world. And most of the 50 million are here in the Philippines. This is your working class at this point. Most of these IDs are very familiar to the uh, Filipinos. You have here your social security ID. You have here your um, mutual development fund ID. You have here your PhilHealth for your, uh, for, for your health care and for the government officials the GSIS card. So each and every part of the workforce actually holds one of these. Our job was to put them or roll them into one. Now, the, the service that we are doing right now is for all your workers, we act, well, the government actually makes sure that we do not own specific or personnel that are doing or trying to be, a diff, trying to host a different, different identity. Maybe in the US right now, identity theft is very common. Here, it's becoming, um, we have stopped it uh, before it even started. So, what, is, what was our role here? For the Filipinos here, you know that we are capturing fingerprints as part of the uh, requirement for these IDs. Going or providing services for all of these, now it's become simpler. So, well, for the resources that we have, sorry. We now have a common ID. We are trying to take out the national ID thing from this. We call it the unified multipurpose ID. At this point, for the benefit of everyone, we're dealing with 20 million, around 20 million workforce that are registered in this system. So I think most of the people that are uh, with your company are now members of this system. Next, travel documents. So this was the travel document of the late um, President Rojas. Uh, historically, for the last eight years, when I joined NEC, you are still at the handwritten passports. And these identity documents were, had, had some issues with the, with the other countries. Now, for everyone's information as well, way back eight years ago, we were the last two countries who actually shifted to the machine-readable readable documents. And from that point on, we have made two successful changes in the document from the machine-readable side down to the electronic chip passports. What is the effect? So, 
Most of you are familiar with this. For those who fly to the Philippines, there's a common adage right now. The traffic in Manila starts when you get off the plane. I think this is what they're referring to. This is the current immigration control right now. With the introduction of e-passports, with the introduction of these technologies, sorry, I failed to um, give this information. In 2013, we have become uh, the 45th busiest country in the world, hosting 80, 87,000 international flights with around 50 million passengers moving in and out on the international routes only. So, what are we trying to say? ICT's role now, with the introduction of the electronic chips, we hope to be seeing all of these non or electronic gates in our airport. We hope. So, this is where we are partnering with the government for them to move forward into these type of applications. So, okay, uh, this one is uh, what we did for Singapore, and this is the one that we did for Thailand. Uh, some of the airports in Tokyo have also been implemented here. What, what are we trying to say here? Your e-passports should contain, or will contain, a biometric fingerprint. You put your e-passports uh, at the start of the lane, it would read off the electronic chip, you put in your fingerprint, and you're off immigration. So, gone are the days we're in, I have to judge people based on the number of stamps they have on a passport. Gone are the days we're in, I would have someone looking over the person and scrutinizing whether um, he's allowed to actually enter the country. Remember, this picture, 80% of which are returning home. Right? Okay. So, other than that, we also go into the public administration services. There is an electoral process in this country. We used to have issues with this. It's a cartoon character of flying voters. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a cultural um, issue that we, in partnership with the Commission on Elections, uh, went to correct. So we have introduced the Commission on Elections has actually introduced um, the com computerized voters list wherein each voter would be required to actually have his fingerprint taken. For all the Filipinos out there, please bear in mind, a new law has been passed that you cannot vote unless your fingerprint is taken for the 2016 election. So for those, for those who still believe in our voting process, please. Now, what do we have? At this point, we have 50 million registered voters. For those who know the population of the country, this is your um, actual retirees and the workforce minus the, uh, those in school. So we're still growing at a faster rate than where we should be going, but we have captured most of those uh, most, of Joe, most of those records for the electoral process. Okay. The R&D of NEC has been always uh, has started with the law enforcement. But we're seeing um, these technologies being brought forth into the enterprise and into the civilian, um, civilian population. So you're seeing fingerprint identification a few years back, you, you only get fingerprinted because of some crime that you have committed. Now it's a different story. Facial recognition was used for photos, um, to detect photos in the CCTV cameras that are uh, evolving in the cities. You would see now citywide, in most of the traffic lights that we have, we have the uh, CCTV cameras monitoring traffic. So facial recognition, on the law enforcement has now become um, a, civilian, a civilian application as well. I'll go into where the civilians are actually doing or uh, using the um, technology right now. So other than that, we also have the plate number detection systems. 
It's also being used now for civilian uh, applications rather than the law enforcement. Okay. So in, 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 this, uh, in this slide, the Philippine National Police actually have their own um, criminal automated fingerprint identification system. Those that you would see in uh, NCIS or CSI. So these are the technologies that we, uh, a lot of people uh, are not familiar with, but we have been working in partnership with them to be able to bring, bring that public safety, uh, public safety concern uh, moving forward. So, facial recognition. Where is this technology in right now? Most of the, well, hospitality industry, most of the, uh, the uh, buildings or the workforce that, uh, that we are, if you're dealing with 4,000 people coming in and out of your office and you wouldn't really know which one is actually belonging to you or not, and then you have these IDs to actually identify them. Now, I can actually match, or the technology is very mature to actually match faces across a live feed. So we, we are installing this on airports for, for banks or for hospitality industries. The, the business owner would want to know if a VIP goes into his business place. He wants to be warned right there and then. The bank manager or the hotel GM, if somebody I know I would register it in my uh, system. I don't have to save it, but this information is now helping businesses grow. They're also using this for queue monitoring. Let's say the, the queue for uh, hotel check-in goes longer. I would have to open some uh, other uh, check-in counters. And secure area monitoring and access control. I can have a whitelist in my own organization or in my own workplace to make sure that everybody that goes in and out of that workplace is my employee. Case in point, a cruise. Right now, before you even climb up a boat, some of the cruise lines register your photos because during the cruise, they would want to know that all passengers inside that boat are the ones that should be inside that boat. And nobody knows that it's being monitored and it's being captured. Okay. So, again, these were technologies from, from law enforcement or from a military application now being, being brought forth into the enterprise. In the guise of public safety, what we're saying here is we've also developed uh, sophisticated sensor systems. So, we have high sensitivity cameras for, for those um, areas that require, let's say I'm, I'm monitoring a bay, Manila Bay. At night, I cannot, have a, I cannot have a huge spotlight just monitoring where everybody's going, whether there's a boat in there. We have all those cameras now that are able to identify a boat even a mile or two miles away. Even at low light, they call it starlight, uh, starlight technology. Now, video surveillance. The cities, not yet here, but um, we've done this in Singapore. The city surveillance system is no longer monitored by people looking at the video cameras. I can now detect behaviors like crowd control. If there's a crowd somewhere in the street, I would want to understand what's happening. Second, if I, if I am able to detect automatically that somebody faints on the street, there has to be an alarm by the CCTV itself to tell the monitors that there's something wrong with that street. Third, an unmanned object left behind in a bus terminal, left behind on the train, is being monitored automatically by the system as well. They call this now the intelligence video surveillance. For those cameras that are able to detect voice, I can now detect screaming. So for me to respond to those screams, for me to respond to those uh, possible uh, crises, I am able to, to do this proactively. This is their investment or their, this is their method of saying that this city is ready now for whatever um, businesses it's prepared for. So we are also moving uh, this country towards that. So 
some of the case studies that we have, the recently mentioned uh, World Cup, uh, the football stadiums have been put in a surveillance system with specific behaviors. The behaviors are very different. Uh, so they've managed to do that in all the stadiums. And then in Argentina, the whole city is under surveillance as well. Um, I didn't put Singapore here because Singapore was spread into four quadrants. And my colleague from uh, Accenture actually owns one of the quadrants uh, that is being monitored in Singapore. Aside from that, we have the solutions for emergency and disaster management. We're now working with the, uh, with the local government to put in earthquake, tsunami, observation systems. These are proactive measures. There were questions like uh, the most successful one that has been announced to the press is in Taiwan. I would be able to determine whether an earthquake is coming, how big is the tsunami that's coming, how can I simulate the damage that will be done um, in Metro Manila or uh, all the other stations? Okay. There's also a so-called emergency cloud system. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussions were done on the cloud, wherein most of the public enterprise or even the private enterprise would be able to host uh, their systems on a cloud-based system, just in case something, uh, any disaster or emergency happened. Information management. Information management has now become, or IT in itself has now become a threat. So in public safety, we also have worked with Interpol. There's going to be, a, in, in um, late this year, there's an Interpol digital forensic lab wherein most of the investigations for cyber crimes will be done in this region. So we worked with Interpol in in creating that environment. So what, 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 what have we done? From incident visualization, security surveillance based on IT, and most importantly, cyber response training. We have come up with training facilities to enable the enterprise to be able to respond to these attacks. So I'm not sure if, if everyone was able to notice that in the last few months, in June 12, we've had a major traffic coming in from the other countries going to the Philippines. Some were able to uh, withstand those, some were not very unfortunate. So, and, but everyone knows that it's just a heavy traffic coming in. But nobody really knows what was the intention for. But we know Philippines was the target. Interagency collaboration. We have achieved this with Pagibig, NSO, SSS, and uh, PhilHealth. But we still have a long way to go in trying to uh, corroborate or synchronize all of the agencies here. It's not only us. This problem persists across all the other countries. In the other countries, each agency, let's say I'm from the, um, I'm, I'm from the transport system, the other person is from the environmental system, each of us has his own CCTV to cover a specific, the same area. So what has been done for the Singapore Safe City Testbed is to put in the same sensors wherein all the agencies would be able to tap into. And we have to make sure that the data is not tampered with. So there, there is a non-repudiation uh, system that has been put in place. So, mo well, we're not in this space yet, but we're, we're hoping that we can move uh, all the other agencies to actually collaborate. So, challenges in ICT. I've been, I've been working with uh, government projects for quite a while. The projects that I have just presented to you were, uh, I was uh, indirectly or directly part of those uh, projects. First is budget justification. Most of the budget that we do for ICT in the public safety team is, is, is seen as a, uh, a nice to have rather than a requirement. As soon as you're able to justify the budget, the next is sustainability. We are dealing with software, we're dealing with hardware that reaches its end of life. And we all know for a fact, IT right now 
has a short lifespan as compared to what the other equipments were uh, a few years back. So, after five years, you go back and ask for another budget justification. <laughs> if I'm looking at a tsunami alert system, I didn't really see a tsunami coming in within the last five years. I would assure you, the next budget justification, it would be slashed. And it would be left <laughs> to die a natural death. This is my last slide, but I wanted to show this. I'm not sure if, if most of you would be able to remember this. I, don't, I didn't. I just saw this from the movies. This was built by Chrysler. This is, these are not huge bullhorns. These are actually air raid sirens. There was a time that this was the top priority of every city in that era. At some point, it became a nice to have. At some point, it didn't really matter, right? My question now, if for some reason, what happened 40 years or 50 years ago happened now, would this still be, would this still be a thing of the past or will, will we need this? Or is it important? There's a mindset that we need, to, uh, we need to change. From our end, we're partnering with the government to be able to do that. I leave everyone with this. It's better to have and not need, rather than need and not have. Thank you, everyone, and hope you have a good day.